In the Sports Light is a show you can watch as many times as you want as it remains online. We aim to give you the opportunity to hear from athletes both past and present about their achievements and accomplishments. Now let's join your host, Earl Baston. Couples as a player was a highly regarded right winger known for his speed and his work rate. We asked him what inspiring words did he get as a youngster that helped his career. Oh, that's a difficult question, a uh, good question. Uh, I think as a kid growing up, you, you sort of think so visually about things. And for me, uh, growing up, I always remember the first time I walked into Anfield. I'm from Liverpool and my father took me to watch Liverpool play. And as a boy, five years of age, going to watch Liverpool, walking into that stadium, seeing the beautiful green pitch, the huge, big stands, and I saw Liverpool play and I thought, even at that early age, I want to be a footballer. And that has been a dream from when I was, as I say, five years of age. It, it's driven me through some bad times where I thought I'm, I'm never going to make any progress. It kept me going through good times and, and, and give me a focus of, of my sport in life, I suppose. So nothing verbal, just the dream born out of my father taking me to the game and that connection which lasted for many years. So I was talking to the coaches today and I said, first and foremost, you have to have a vision. And a vision is like the dream. You have to have a dream about the way you want your team to play. You have to have a vision, a style of play. You have to aspire to play like Barcelona or Bayern Munich or Manchester United or whoever. Now, when you got that phone call or the invite to, to start your pro career, um, what was those moments like for you? Well, my, I was a little bit different because I, I um, wanted to get an education, so I did my A-levels in England. So I got to 18 and I thought at 18, professional football had passed me by. I thought, well, so be it. And at 18 years of age, I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to teach economics. I was doing economics, very interested in economics, still am. And I wanted to teach PE as well, physical education. So. At 18, I was playing football and really enjoying it just for my boys' club. And then uh, I got a, a call from a, a, a scout. He said, uh, I work for Tramere Rovers. We're having a trial match on Sunday. Would you like to play? And I at first said no, because I was revising for my exams. And then he phoned me up again. He said, we're playing at Prenton Park, which is Tramere's home ground. And I thought, oh, play on a proper stadium. So I went and uh, I scored three goals. I played really well, I was delighted, and they invited me to train. Uh, Tranmere didn't have a lot of money, and for some strange reason, I wanted to play in the Football League as an amateur. And I achieved that goal, and Tranmere were delighted <laughs> that I didn't want to be paid. So I actually played for a year for Tranmere in the Football League as an amateur, the Corinthian spirit. I don't know why, looking back now, I think you must be stupid. <laughs> Could have been paid for it, but I didn't. And then eventually um, I got paid 10 pounds a week was my first contract at Tranmere Rovers. And uh, then I got transferred to United. But the initial phone call from the, the scout at Tranmere, who looking back now, I owe my whole, whole life to, my whole professional career to, uh, I, I said no. So. I think it was just meant to be. It was one of those things that was meant to be, and thank heaven he was persistent and invited me again. Now, looking back to when you first started playing, to how the game has transformed to today, yeah. what what have you seen over those years? How uh, sponsorship and just the stadiums, how everything has changed around the game itself? Massive change and an ongoing rate of change. Um, you know, starting out as a, a young player, then um, there wasn't a great deal of money around for players. The stadiums were run down. We had all the problems with Hillsborough and then Heysel, and thank heaven, uh, safety now is a critical factor in all the modern stadiums. And in terms of the football, it's a lot more technical. There's a lot more science involved, there's a lot more computer and TV analysis, 
the transformation is enormous and it's ongoing and now we have video referees and that's going to become more and more pronounced as time goes on thankfully it's a game of massive change which I hope is getting better and better I think the Premiership in England is such an attractive uh, package for the rest of the world you get to hear in Bermuda you watch every game it, it's, it's such a big pull for for everybody in England and the rewards perhaps have become too great with the size of some of the packages and the players have become a little bit too distant from the fans so it's not all 100% positive but the game itself is now more attractive I think than ever. Now putting on that England jersey for the first time, proud moment? Unbelievably proud moment because again I, I, I made my debut for England when I was 22 I think, 23. I was playing in a Manchester United team which was full of internationals and during, before I was picked for England, during international week everyone disappeared <laughs> and I was left, that was it, I was one of the, I think two or three of us didn't play international football and then when I, I pulled on uh, the international shirt for the first time, Ron Greenwood gave me my first cap, my first game was against Italy at Wembley walking out of Wembley, my heart almost jumped out of my chest. Um, you know, thankfully my grandfather, my father was there. It, it was, you know, such a proud moment for me. We won the game 2-0. I thought international football was easy. <laughs> How wrong I was proven to be. It, it was uh, a wonderful, wonderful memory. Now, what is the growing concern in the English game with so many outside players playing in the Premiership that not a lot of England players are actually playing in the Premiership to help the when it becomes an international tournament. Yeah, well, we have a, the structure of English football is wrong for success really on an international level. You have the FA that runs the England team and you have the Premier League which runs the professional game. They have two different ambitions. The England team wants to win the World Cup. The Premier League wants to be commercially successful around the world. The Premier League have been massively successful. They make so much money from TV rights from around the world. Wherever you go in the world, people watch Premiership football. So their criteria, the box has been ticked. Now, the contradiction, the two, the two ambitions can never meet. World football domination and the TV in, in your lounge, your home, depends on fabulous talent from around the world. So Liverpool have got Suarez, Man United have got the, the top international players, Arsenal, a team full of foreign players. But whenever a World Cup comes around, whenever a European Championship comes around, every Englishman wants to see the England team be successful. And when they don't, they look for reasons why. The number one reason why England I feel will not be successful in the near future is because there are not enough English players playing in the English Premier League. I personally feel there should be a, a, a quota. Half the team should be English. Now we're never going to transform that overnight but over the next couple of years we could have a minimum level which increases slowly so no team could protest really that they don't have enough notice. But there should be a responsibility for English teams to develop young English ta talent. You look, I go and watch under 21 football, academy football, and a lot of the teams now are full uh, of uh, foreign youngsters. Mm. The Premier League, the top clubs, the 12, 13, 14 years of age, bring the best talent from around the world and develop that talent for other nations to, to be successful in World Cups. I think there's a balance to be had. Premier League will still be successful, there'll be a commitment to English football. You know, we're a, a proud footballing nation, we've only won the World Cup once and that was 66 on our home turf. It would be great if we were competitive, first and foremost of this World Cup coming up in Brazil. Traditionally English teams don't do well, or European teams don't do well in South America, so it's unlikely. But it would be great if in the future there was an agenda, at the very least an agenda, to develop more young English players. With, with the way the players are paid now, how does the manager get them to understand his philosophy of 
wanting to play this style of football? Um, you have to, I always think football is about the team. Mm -hmm. There's no I in team, so you can't have 12 different philosophies. There's only one philosophy and that's the manager's philosophy. Now there, there, are, there is so much money in football now that if a player doesn't agree with what you're trying to, to teach, he can just tell you to get lost because he can then go somewhere else and earn exactly the same money. But the, the true top managers inspire the team. They have the common goal. They have the same agenda to reach the same target, success, winning trophies, silverware. And a, a successful manager gets into the very heart, soul and mind of a footballer to convince him this is the right thing to do. I have your best interests at heart as well as the club's best interests at heart and they are convinced. A lesser manager finds that hard to do and that's when you get people going off at tangents on the, their own little missions and quite often, I hate to say it now but the money is so great that sometimes the mission is just to get a transfer every couple of years because it's more money involved. But the true champions, I, I think it's best, best illustrated by the top clubs you don't want to leave the top clubs because usually they win things. I always remember the day I signed for Manchester United, Tommy Doherty was my manager and he sat me down and he said, Steve, I want you to remember, any move from Manchester United is a move down. And I believed it. And you could argue today, any move from Man United is a move down. And you feel very privileged to play for Manchester United. I feel as if I've been part of an elite club not many people in it have been part of it and I'm very conscious of the fact that I used to be a Man United player and if I hadn't finished my career at United I would have been frightened of going anywhere else because it would have been that. Now you must have caught some stick coming from Liverpool to play for Manchester United. But ironically when I played for Manchester United I was born closest to Manchester. All that team, there were Scotsmen, Irishmen, <laughs> Welshmen, we had a Yugoslav. The next closest was somebody from Yorkshire. When I played for United, there wasn't a player from Manchester in the team. And you look now at the class of 92, that great class, Beckham, the Nevilles, all those were Manchester boys, Paul Scholes, you know, Beck, uh, they, were, they were all Manchester boys, but at that stage, you know, certainly under Tommy Doherty, he seems every time he went to Scotland, he brought back a player with him. So, uh, I was ironically the one born closest to Manchester. But you're right. You know, I went to university in Liverpool. I supported Liverpool. Um, but when I walked out at Old Trafford for the first time, I knew where I wanted to play. At the end of 90 minutes. Final question: the position your old club find themselves in now. There's a lot of fans pulling different ways. Your message to the Bermuda Manchester United supporters would be? Be patient. I, I would say look back to when Sir Alec Ferguson came to Manchester United. For three years they weren't very good. For three years they didn't figure in the league at all. And for three years he spent a lot of money relative to the times. Spent a lot of money and there didn't appear to be any light at the end of the tunnel and he was under pressure big time at certain stages. They stuck with him and look what happened. Now this dark days indeed for, for David Moyes. There is so much pressure on him. But hark back, he's had a great apprenticeship at Everton. 10 years in the Premiership, he couldn't be better prepared than he is. But the magnitude of Manchester United, it's huge. The magnitude of the, the shoes he's had to fill, huge. It takes time to adjust. Critical period this summer, obviously, the quality, the number of his signings, and then the start of next season. Now, Alex Ferguson got three years. David Moyes, will he get three years? I don't know. The, he has to show, I think, early on next season that his signings are significant and have had an effect. And then it will be decision time. But he's a determined young manager, he's a good young manager, and I would be confident that he will turn the situation around.